tonight's investigation into what really happened in Rendlesham Forest, James Warrow, science researcher, Simon Holland, physics historian and filmmaker, join John Burroughs, who both experienced and was injured by the highly strange events in Suffolk, England, in December 1980. things are real, they're here, this is happening now. There has been and is an existing presence. You don't have to go anywhere. You can find it here. Yeah. Our night that we went out there, they were blasting the phenomenon with EM frequencies. Because those blue lights that we saw, plasma's being targeted by lasers. They got immediately merged into UFOs. Uh, and I'm not sure what UFOs are. Uh, but these aren't spacecraft. These aren't extraterrestrial. High power radars and ionospheric heaters are capable of making atmospheric plasmas. They may be swept across the, the sky in regular or intelligent patterns. We have now released land quick strike. Repeat, we have now released land quick strike. Former MOD employee Nick Pope writes, the UK government, and other governments too, I suspect, have been indeed hiding information on UFOs. MOD scientific and technical intelligence personnel believed that, if harnessed, UFOs might be able to be militarized. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Randlesham Forest investigation. We're in for a treat tonight. I think really, we have cracked it. We've talked a lot about the peripheral. We've given you all the information, but we want to actually get down to the nitty gritty of what's actually going on. And we've made a lot of promises. And in this film, we do deliver. So let's dive into this incredible question that we're asking is John Burroughs, What's the advantage of actually weaponizing a UAP, you know, an amorphous blob in the sky? How are UAP, how can they be useful to the military? All I can say is this, based on my background of 27 years in the military, where I saw when I came in in 1979, what I saw then and what I saw prior to my retirement in 2006, everything changed. And when you go down the path of looking at like we are, and, and I wanna say one thing, Professor, what we're doing is we're going and taking a hard look at the evidence that's been provided to us, partly from me meeting people, right. uh, you know, my military background, meeting certain people being drawn into this by the other side, the technical side, the different people I've met, talked to, and have helped me along the way. And then all of James's research and everything. To answer those questions, you have to understand what a UAP is. And then after you get a better right. working idea of a UAP by looking at what the military is looking at or the governments are looking at, then you can further expand on this. That such research was of interest to the MOD is demonstrated in a document of 4th of December 2000 called Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, UAP. DI-55 report, which reveals Director General Research and Technology will be interested in those phenomena associated with plasma formations, which have potential applications for novel weapon technology. The atmospheric plasmas, which were believed to be the cause of so many UFO reports, were still barely understood, said the MOD, and the magnetic and electric fields that emanated from plasmas could adversely affect the human nervous system. And it wasn't just the British Ministry of Defence and the Russians who recognised the potential military spin-offs that both plasmas and ball lightning offered, 
official documentation that has surfaced in the United States reveals that only two years after pilot Kenneth Arnold's now historic UFO encounter over the Cascade Mountains, Washington State, the US military secretly began looking at ways to exploit such earthly plasma phenomena. How do you measure the parameters of what we are seeing in the sky and how well, is that useful? What was very useful were the 37 um, papers, they say 38, but two of them were actually, one was classified and one was unclassified, the same paper. Um, so 37 papers um, were very intriguing, um, especially obviously the, the papers from um, Dr. Christopher Green. Um, but the, the other papers um, that were talking about uh, the observables, basically five observables, um, just collated into right. into um, things that people can can study. Basically, um, for instance, the sudden and instantaneous acceleration was one observable within these UAPs. Hypersonic velocities mm. uh, without signatures uh, was another one. Low observability uh, was another observ observable they was looking at. Um, also, transmedium travel, which is basically, you know, something that can not only um, mm. operate within the sea, it can also come out of the sea, operate in, the, the, uh, in our atmosphere and also operate in space, you know, without any kind of detriment to its components. Um, and the, 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 the fifth was uh, positive lift, which was all to do with objects apparently resisting the natural Earth's um, the effects of Earth's gravity. These aren't the, the types of things that you would see being used commercially. These are the types of higher end um, potential technologies that will only start from one place, and that is through Department of Defence funding to make sure that any of this, any of these advances in physics they will be the ones that are the first past the post because the obvious thing that's been going on for years that if anyone else is first past the post then we are the losers and they don't and, mm. and the west obviously like the like like the east they don't want to be behind on anything that may be out there or other countries may be actually looking at i think that's amazing because what we're saying here is, first of all, the big absolute admission, you know, for skeptics that UAP exists, UAP are real, because we have a defense industry, as you've just clearly said, who are looking at five observables that they're, that they're regularly seeing in these type of craft. So that's what's being exploited. You know, forget about you know disclosure we have disclosure because there's defense contractors and governments who know what's out there who know what they're seeing and are utilizing those observables this is clearly the future of exotic warfare to include like james says the 37 papers and it clearly shows that the people that wrote these papers had access to uh to the phenomenon itself and the data that has come from the phenomenon. Via the Freedom of Information Act, John Burroughs asked the UK Ministry of Defence, please provide the following records on the weaponization of UAP for the years 2012 and 2013. A review of the information has now been completed within the Ministry of Defence and we can confirm that information in scope of your request is held but some of the information falls entirely within the scope of the absolute exemptions provided for a Section 40, Personal Data, Section 27 to 1, International Relations, and Section 43, Commercial Interests. So your Freedom of Information request has been withheld. Section 26 is a qualified exemption and is subject to public interest testing, which means that the information requested can only be withheld if the public interest in doing so outweighs the public interest in disclosure, because it gives details of techniques 
which might be employed on future platforms. Compromise of these techniques years before implementation may result in a reduction in effectiveness and, more importantly, the likelihood that this technology could advance a foreign power's ability to gain tactical advantage. Overall, the public interest is best served in not releasing any details of techniques, the knowledge of which would be likely to provide tactical advantage to our enemies. Section 43 has been applied to some information as this was supplied to DSTL from a third party and contains commercially sensitive information, the public release of which could harm that party's commercial interests. As you can see, the MOD and defence contractors are studying and working on weaponizing UAP technology. John, that's really interesting that you submitted that Freedom of Information request uh, to the British MOD. Uh, how do you interpret their uh, response? Well, this is the interesting thing. I had some insight on what to ask based on some information that had been provided to uh. me through direct and indirect sources. And the direct stuff was a two-page letter that was written by Christopher Green to the VA to explain to them what to look for, why I was sick, and how to treat it. So he wrote this paper, and once he wrote this paper, I, I read it, I submitted it to the VA, and that's when everything changed as far as how they, they responded to me, the treatment they gave me, and everything else. But within it, it gave out specific things about what happened to me, what affected me. Now, he opened up some of that in an above top secret post he made after I got my settlement. But some of the stuff that was in this letter, I was told by somebody inside the DOD that that was classified stuff that I should never have had access to. So once I gained all this information, I started peppering the MOD with questions. And at one point, I got a response one time because I'd hit them Sunday night here, Monday morning in the UK. They get it when they walk in on Monday. And one of the guys says, well, I can answer yeah. this one particular question that's been given to me, but we have a whole group working on the rest of your questions. So I was getting pointed into areas of not, or, or do you have a, a UFO in the hangar? you know, and different things like that, asking certain questions no. about technology. And what was interesting was when I zeroed in on, this is just one of the FOIAs, there's two other ones that I that I haven't made public, was that they were very surprised oh, yeah. that I asked these questions. And what's interesting about that, you know, at least at that point in the United Kingdom's, you know, FOIA answers, they answered my question, where in the United States, you would probably not even get a straight answer. But they did answer, oh. and that was their response. And mm -hmm. they did send me some documents, and everything was blacked out, except for a couple little things. One of the, one of the things yeah. that wasn't blacked out was uh, a name of a, a company, and that was a tank company in Ohio. And what's interesting is how put off oh. has gotten a contract to work on using time dilation to cloak tanks. So... They clearly know more than what was presented in Condine, but as far as Condine goes, a lot of it's still classified. And what's most of what's still mm -hmm. classified is the source material. It's not the report, but it's the source material that he drew from right. to write the report. And Grish just ran into that same problem when he was put in, you know, in charge of trying to find out was the government hiding anything through the, you know, through the DOD. And he found out that he found some reports, but he couldn't get access to the source material. So they're clearly, they're aware that UAPs exist and they're definitely working on it. And they have, it, have either have or are in the process of making this stuff operational. Via further Freedom of Information Act by Nick Redfern, a whole host of documents from the files of Harness Cavalier, now numbering more than 120, have surfaced, demonstrating research into the field of ball lightning and particularly how it might be exploited militarily. Such documentation includes theory of the lightning ball and its application to the atmospheric phenomenon called flying saucers, written by Carl Benedicts, 
ball lightning a survey prepared by one J.R. McNally for the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, D.V. Ritchie's Reds May Use Lightning as a Weapon, which appeared in Missiles and Rockets Review, and an experimental and theoretical program to investigate the feasibility of confining plasma in free space by radar beams, which was written by C.M. Harland for the Armour Research Foundation, Illinois Institute of Technology. The strongest evidence that confirms Edgewood Arsenal's deep interest in the potential use of ball lightning on the battlefield can be found in a December 1965 document entitled Survey of Kugelblitz Theories for Electromagnetic Incendiaries. Written by W.B. Little and C.E. Wilson, the document was prepared under contract for the U.S. Army's New Concepts Division Special Projects at Edgewood. So that's very interesting. There's a name of Kublitz. Um, I think I know what it is, but James Warrow, tell our audience what is the German well, word Kublitz. Kublitz. Um, is a German word for ball lightning, um, basically. Um, right. It's a you know translation for ball lightning. Um, there's a, there was a paper that can be found on the Defence Technical Information Centre website. Um, it was written in 1955. And um, there was a uh, a study to re basically to review the theory and experimental data on ball lightning, um, and it was to compare the existing theory and experimental data um, to determine if ball lightning is a high or low energy phenomena, and if it was actually a high energy phenomena, mm. could it be defined as a, as an effective theoretical and experimental program to develop a potential incendiary weapon? Now, the actual report um, in regards to plasma, the, mm -hmm. the report contains basic concepts, uh, basic plasma physics, class classical plasma theories, quantum plasma theories, as well as non-plasma theories. Um, but what I also found interesting was the, uh, the concept um, of the, the, the theory of actually guidance and feeding of ball lightning uh, or kugel blitz by laser beams mm -hmm. i would just like to um add pl plasma has been studied for a long time and um you know we see it as a an exotic uh, weird stuff but it's actually you can actually um break plasma down into a physical weapon imagine if you had a uh, laser um induced plasma and when you um when you ionize our atmosphere this doesn't work in space but our atmosphere and you put enough energy into a, a focal point a plasma ball expands to the size of the energy and john you'll understand this what happens when something in our atmosphere goes boom it sends out a shock wave and it actually can be used as little poof per percussive weapons you know a ball suddenly appearing in front of an aircraft or close enough to actually cause physical damage you can actually have plasma related impact have you uh, john have you come across a weapon system which isn't you know physical but is electrostatic that produces mechanical or shockwave well, effects this is where this is where i struggle with some of this i've seen certain types of technology after the event that if if i'd have known about it when the event took place i would have had a better understanding of what happened to us but the fact of the matter was is when we experienced what we did we had no idea that what they were working on just outside the back gate and what you have to ask the question no matter and i understand why the nuts and bolts ufo people don't like this but again, I want to emphasize, we're not saying this is a one size all answer to everything that's going on. What we're trying to do is show what we were exposed to at Rendlesham and what this group has come forward now and is pushing Congress on the weaponization of this particular technology. So we're, we're not trying to say that there's not any other life forms or possibilities. We're just focusing on this. And you have to ask the first question is, why was there so many facilities outside that back gate in that area? We've established there were. Mm -hmm. We've shown that Andrew Pike was down there studying the phenomenon that he's talked about in this in his book 
in which we covered some in this film. So you have to ask, ask yourself, yes, there is stuff out there. Yes, there is stuff that's, that they were testing and working on back then. And yes, there's stuff operational now. But for me to go into what I directly seen and where and how, right. uh, I, I can't do that. Yeah. I mean, people can get mad at me or whatever, but no. I, I did raise my right hand and come into military. And, and I have mm. to be careful on what I saw personally up front that still could be classified to this day. But J James, w um, would you agree with me that, I mean, weapons of war don't have to be led? I mean, they can, you know, we, we are now in a post Manhattan um, world where that Pandora's box was never closed and physics can be used to alter people, minds, and also have physical effects and exotic effects such as time dilation. Would you agree with that, well, James? Well, I would. I mean, considering um, the apparent effects uh, of people that have experienced um, or been in close proximity to UAP, again, this goes back to Dr. Christopher Green, who John commented on um, previous, uh, earlier. Now, uh, we know one of the papers that he wrote, again, is very helpful. One of the papers that he wrote was uh, anomalous acute and subacute field effects on human biological tissues. Um, and I'll please, if anyone's out there that, that, that wants to, uh, the, for, as an eye opener, people really need to read this one, one particular paper um, because it talks about potential development of advanced weapons technology. Uh, as part of the subject um, of interest, he states not only the side effects associated with possible lift and propulsion field mechanisms of advanced craft architectures, but also effects from advanced weapon systems as well. Um, they include, but are not limited to beam weapons, active denial systems, including higher powered microwaves. So what we seem to have in this paper are uh, apparent effects from anomalous aerial objects, you know, um, aerospace objects, what, what, he, what he terms. Um, the the actual effects are quite quite frightening, really. Um, there, there's many sort of pathophysiological effects, a lot uh, heating and burn injuries from ionising and non-ionising uh, radiation. Right. Uh, there's neural effects as well. The cognitive and the central nervous system seem to be um, affected uh, in some of these events. Here's the problem that you've got to understand. First of all, it's it's energy, the ability to generate the energy to utilize this technology. Computing also. But the other factor that comes into what James is talking about is this. We just had a warning from some of the top business people in technology in the United States saying AI is a danger. But then the counter to that was, well, if we stop developing and working in this area where it could be dangerous to humanity, then the Chinese won't, neither will the Russians, and neither will the other countries. So right. the race is always on to who can, you know, get this, get this the quickest and then have control of the power. It's no different than what happened back in World War II with the atomic bomb. So... It's not always just directly mm -hmm. evil, pure evil, but it's the fact that some people really believe that they have to counter evil by creating the very thing that evil would use on us in the first place. And even the fact that the atomic bomb was utilized, one of the, one of the reasons why they said was that if we let everybody just see how bad this could affect humanity, it'll never be used again. Well, so far they've been right, but the people that suffered the consequences was for the civilians, not the military, and the people behind the government that created a problem in the first place would probably beg the difference. Maybe we're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everyone else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about here, and we're seeing strange lights in the sky. It appears that you may be moving a little bit this way. Yes, it's brighter than it has been. Yeah, it's coming this way. Oh, here, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. 
in Deputy Base Commander Holt's own words, describing what he perceived in Rendlesham Forest, a red sun-like light was seen through the trees. It moved about and pulsed. At one point, it appeared to throw off glowing particles and then broke into five separate white objects and then disappeared. Immediately thereafter, three star-like objects were noticed in the sky. The object to the south was visible for two or three hours and beamed down a stream of light from time to time. To this writer, at least, reports of beams of light seen in conjunction with moving lights that emitted glowing particles sound very much like someone putting into practice the theoretical plans cited within the pages of the Survey of Kugelblitz Theories for Electromagnetic Incendiaries document, namely the control and utilization of ball lightning or plasma phenomena via lasers. Indeed, Holt's reference to the object in the woods appearing to throw off glowing particles sounds astonishingly like the words the US Weather Bureau used back in 1948 to describe ball lightning. It has been reported that the luminous body may break up into a number of smaller balls which may appear to fall towards the Earth like a rain of sparks. It has even been reported that the ball has suddenly ejected a whole bundle of many luminous radiating streamers toward the Earth. Was some sort of clandestine experiment of the type envisaged in the Edgewood Arsenal documentation secretly undertaken in Rendlesham Forest in 1980? It should be noted that practically all those implicated in the affair were members of the US military. In view of this, it may very well be an indication that someone was very interested in determining the psychological reactions of military personnel when confronted by phenomena perceived to be both extremely unusual and potentially extraterrestrial in origin. Might there be dangers to humans from advanced weapons based on UAP technology? We've established that at the Rendlesham Forest incident that personnel were injured. John has had some serious injuries. Other people have had a range of injuries. Jo John Burroughs, please confirm, just to drive this home, that you are an injured person and there's other service people that you served with in England in 1980 who actually was were injured by something at Rendlesham well, Forest. Okay, this is where it gets interesting because different people have challenged me on, you know, they've not right. just challenged me, they've challenged my settlement. But they also, I'll give them mm -hmm. some, say some of it's fair play because I never have put the total settlement packet out. So, but we did, my lawyer and I did provide to Billy Cox, who wrote an article about, he saw the settlement, the whole packet. He saw what we presented and what was presented was I was injured in the line of duty, which is the VA confirmed that much. You can't get a settlement from the VA unless you're injured in the line of duty. So I was injured in the line of duty during the okay. Reynolds from Forest incident. And the, the documentation to prove that, a couple of the things that were presented was a condom report. Colonel Halt wrote a letter. General Williams presented some evidence. And the, the fact mm -hmm. that there was other evidence provided that this happened during the event at Reynolds from so, yes, I was injured during the Ron Wilson event. What the DOD and the VA have never explained or don't want to answer is exactly what injured injured myself and others, including the different people I worked with. I started with Kyle, and Kyle, they told me it was clear I was injured and others were injured, but we'll never get an answer on what it was. Then it went further with the Kane staff when it was handed over to them. The first thing that the head staffer did in Phoenix said was Cheryl Bennett did a yeoman's job to get to be able to prove that I was even in during the event and some of the other stuff that took place. But the fact of the matter was, again, we will never receive an answer on what we were exposed to or what happened to us. So there's one other person that I know for a fact is receiving compensation. And there are two others that have told me indirectly that they also were injured. Actually, the, the one other person is Penniston, was, and he actually admitted it. And he did a citizen's citizens hearing with 
Steve Bassett did it, and he admitted to the people up front that he had heart issues and other issues that came from his experience in Reynolds and Boris. Mm -hmm. So yes, we were injured in Reynolds and Boris. What the government hasn't done, and that's why there's still interest in this case for people inside the government, is exactly what happened to us, what we were exposed to, right. and what are the ramifications, not only to the people involved and some that haven't gotten the compensation and treatment they deserve, but whatever we're exposed to, is it a threat to anybody else? And what I mean by a threat is I'm not saying it's an intentional threat. I'm just saying that when you get hurt, there is a problem that needs to be figured out and solved. Jobs for Christopher Green, obviously, um, has examined people uh, that have been injured by uh, apparently um, anomalous vehicles uh, or exposure to anomalous vehicles, especially airborne, uh, where when relatively in close proximity to these vehicles, um, he he he's. He, he suggests that the, the mechanisms of the injury are related to electromagnetic radiation field effects. Um, he also suggests that the biophysical characteristics of the injuries are also well understood, um, but the actual energy-related right. uh, systems, propulsion systems, are not well understood. Um, he, he, he suggests that everything that, that he's... That he's um, he's looked at, it's been accurately reported and um, medical data has been acquired um, to support a hypothesis that some advanced systems are already deployed uh, and but are opaque to full US understanding. Uh, now, whatever those things are deployed, it doesn't really go into, obviously, whether they're ours, the... Uh, potential adversaries or uh, there's some, something else. He leaves it quite quite open um, to where these effects uh, originate from. He also suggests possible DNA damage, uh, RNA damage, uh, as well as cataracts. Um, and some of the uh, important bandwidths of interest of uh, within the tissue damage uh, from 300 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz um, and as far as we're aware uh, that goes all the way up mm. to the terahertz range which is something that was suggested by dr kit green in his post on above top secret when referring to the case of john burrows there is one final issue that may be of relevance to this latter point the Edgewood Arsenal's biomedical laboratory was the site of a series of controversial experiments that involved the extensive testing of hallucinogens, such as LSD, THC and BZ, as well as a dizzying variety of chemical and biological agents on military personnel. That some of the military witnesses to the Rendlesham events reported having been drugged by unknown officials in the immediate wake of the affair might not be as unbelievable as it initially sounds as well as U.S. military experiments with weird military science. John Burroughs, the U.S. Department of Defense, we have seen has had a history of experimenting with drugs and how it affects humans. You know, they've also definitely experimented on service people. Um, what happened after the Rendlesham Forest incident? There's some reports that in interrogation, in debriefing that drugs were used. Who did it and what kind of drugs? What do you know about well, that? <clears throat> that's the interesting part. I had an interaction with one of the OSI guys involved and he said in an email, he said that we were brought in and that we were, we were all interrogated. Hypnosis was used, sodium and pentanol was used on certain people. Huh. And at one point, Colonel Williams once he realized what was going on, tried to stop it. Different people have said they were interrogated. Different people were exposed to, you know, maybe sodium, pentanol, hypnosis. But right. the final thing that I, I want to say in this is MK Ultra took place in the States prior to our event. I met with the colonel that I right. found a couple of papers that he, he had written on EM weapons and the use of it. I happened to get to meet him because somebody was involved in the event's father knew him. I sat down with him in Phoenix 
two different occasions. But the first time he told me that everything was moved from the United States over to the United Kingdom because Carter was shutting it all down. Mm -hmm. So all this stuff that had been going on Mm -hmm. and stuff to include the fact that if you remember the CIA destroyed all the documents. So they they broke the law as far as Congress goes. So they never got to see exactly what they were doing. But everything was then moved over under contract companies, mostly United Kingdom, um, you know, contracts that were being done right there outside the back. James, I mean, I, you know, I'm British. I've never really heard. I mean, we know about Porton Down and there's obviously, you know, interrogation goes on. Have, have you got any information? Have you heard any gossip, any science papers on on this kind well, of um, CIA or drug? I can't say that I've heard of uh, specific um, drug use on people what i did find out was that the really you must have heard of camp um uh, camp hero the montauk projects uh, in the united states off of long island now yeah there was uh, christopher garantano done lots of work on that himself um and when i was looking at some of some of the um the apparent computers and that, that they were using within camp hero itself turns out there were things um like uh ibm uh eight one hundreds um systems um oh, oh. uh cray supercomputers um that were being utilized at the time um and it when i was looking through the atomic um weapons establishment and their procurements for for some of this stuff that they they gained within the the late 70s early 80s it was all very much the same equipment um now that that could either mean one thing yeah. it, it was something to do with camp hero or it was just basically stuff to utilize for uh, missile defense so the question is out there yeah. basically yeah those the same computer systems were being utilized uh, in the uh, atomic weapons establishment i think the thing that we can't um overestimate and can't make it really clear to our viewers is that special relationship between the US and the UK. Um, The UK has always had a history of uh, being totally supportive and having advanced physics. So, um, you know, I could definitely know that anything that the UK developed would have been shared with the US uh, Department of Defense, you know, to a certain extent, there might be one or two programs that the UK wanted to keep them to themselves. But, you know, the fact that Rendlesham Forest and what happened to John and we've established injuries and other things that have gone on in that area is surrounded by UK um, defense laboratories is because the UK is massively important in, in defense contracts. And it's completely makes sense to me that Bordsy, Orford Ness, you know, Martlesham Heath form a triangle around a piece of scrubby woodland called Rendlesham Forest. It isn't a coincidence. Things were being tried there. Things were being tested. If you go back to the atomic development, the British weren't given everything the Americans mm. had. They kept it secret for a reason because they, they call it loose lips sink ships. The more you share information, especially certain stuff, it can lead to something getting leaked out. But if you go back, I think over the years, right after World War II, after Germany was defeated, there was all the scientists that were brought out of Germany into the United States, Britain and stuff like that, which was they had to keep that kind of covered up because of the crimes they committed over there. But they wanted to, to gleam and start advancing their technology. As the years have gone by, the defense industries have combined more and more. So I believe even BA Systems is owned partly by an American company now. I'm not sure. But they've combined these companies. But there's less and less as far as people, you know, hiding information and stuff because it's a small world now where it was a larger world and you had all these different scientists some of them with the Soviet Union, some of them with the Britain, some of them with the United States. And there were secrets being kept. Right. You know what I mean? And there probably still are. But ultimately, it's, it's, it's basically, if you want to divide the line, 
it's the difference between communism and capitalism or more yeah. the Western world against, yeah. you know, the Eastern Bloc. And it's still going on. There's still a Cold War going on. And the and that's totally. that's the big deal. And that's even like with AI now. A lot of these people see the threat to humanity from it, but we can't stop because if we do, the other side won't. And the other thing that people often, and I fall into this trap going, England did this and America did that. Hang on, folks. We were part of the North Atlantic Treaty. NATO, come on. I mean, Bentwaters was a NATO base. It wasn't an American base. It, you know, b weapons of mass destruction um, that might have been deployed by Americans were allowed to be on Britain and in Holland and in Germany, all NATO members. I mean, John, you were in the U.S. Air Force, but you were you, you were protecting a NATO. Well, base. yeah, that's the thing that people want to argue about, that what most people didn't understand was there was a difference between an American base, a British base and a NATO base. Unfortunately, whether people like it or not, it's about power and whoever controls it, especially depending on where mm -hmm. technology is going. Remember the race in space, the Russians shot the first, you know, did the first shot across the bow and the United States overwhelmed them after that. I mean, SDI was the same thing yeah. that brought down the Soviet Union. But there, 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 there is constant. And what I'm trying to say is there's a constant advancement in weapons. And that's the saddest thing of all, because if we just spend a fraction mm. of what we spend on trying to kill each other and trying to make the world a better place to live, things would be a lot better for everyone. UK physics laboratories surrounding Rendlesham Forest had been studying radar at Bordsey Manor, just a few miles south of Rendlesham. The Bordsey Lab was the birthplace of Robert Watson Watt's radio direction finding system, and after World War II, the UK studied at Bordsey, captured German continuous wave radar systems known to produce plasma ionization called Foo Fighters. On nearby Orford Ness, the UK weapon test site, where Nikola Tesla's death ray was secretly developed, was also the home to Cobra Mist, supposedly an over-the-horizon radar, but rumoured to be an EMP weapon. Advanced power systems and computer guidance control was being researched at the British Telecom Lab by a joint UK and US team. This lab is at Martlesham Heath, just west of Rendlesham Forest, this was not rural Suffolk, but a hotbed of advanced military physics. Right in the middle of the triangle of these military laboratories is an isolated woodland called Rendlesham Forest. And two US Air Force bases, Bentwaters and Woodbridge, full of loyal military personnel who could be exposed to highly strange physics and who in this Cold War era of secrecy kept their mouths shut. So I like asking the question, who, what, where, when, and why. But I think there's an enormous clue, 1980, Cold War, and answering the question, when. John Burroughs, paint us a picture of what was going on in NATO, in the US Air Force, in the world in 1980. Well, let me start by saying this. At the time, we had no idea what was really going on. And what I mean by that was, our job was to defend you know, NATO. That's what the base was there for. No idea what was going on outside the back gate. No idea what Marlowe's from Heath was all about, Bowsey was all about. You know, Eastern Radar was there, the different facilities that were there. Nor did we have any idea what the capabilities of this equipment was. That wasn't our job. You know, we didn't understand the elephant right. cage. We didn't understand the bullet how miss missiles and stuff. It wasn't until years later you know, that I started looking at stuff right. and then got met James and we started working on it together that we started to paint a bigger picture. Now, people from Blurton can go, the BBC's done a good job of covering the history of the nest, or for nest and what was going on there. They nuclear stuff, radar, lasers, all that was worked on there. Okay. SDI was being worked on right. there at Marlos from Heath through Marconi company. And some of the scientists mysteriously died 
after our event that we're working on drones, lasers, satellites, everything that tied into SDI. And here's the problem with education. Somebody will come on and say, well, wait a minute, SDI didn't even start to exist until after Reagan talked about it. No, SDI was on the drawing board way before Reagan started talking about it. And they were working on it. And what we said in prior shows and what I'm saying today is, I didn't know at the time, but now there's more than enough evidence to support that probably was a bigger area for technology development and stuff than Area 51 was and may ever have been because this was a consolidated right. effort. And one other thing that comes into play in this that we've talked about before but needs to be emphasized, they had a power source right up the coast was Sizewell Nuclear Power right. Plant. And the plant at the time when it was mm-hmm. developed, the reactor one, never mind they put the second one on online, was they didn't need that energy at that point in the United Kingdom. To, to you know to make to keep the lights on in the UK that energy was being utilized wow. to develop weapon systems right outside the back gate at RF Woodbridge. taken from the Rendlesham file Britain's Roswell written by Andrew Pike what at first appeared to be a simple case of possible earth lights meteorological and aerial plasma phenomena developed into an investigation which included microwave technology, radar, electromagnetic influences on the human body, including the brain, black budget advances in mind control and exotic aviation, including stealth and gravity modification technologies. There was also evidence from astronomical, geophysical and electromagnetic research going back to the late 1800s, This led to significant clues from scientific advances during World War II, with further answers also coming from the 1950s in plasma physics and astronomy, especially plasma cosmology, right up to the present day. Some of these advances were also made by scientists working alone, away from mainstream science, as a result of the taboo nature of their research. Andrew Pike's book shows that more than just earth lights occurred that Christmas in Rendlesham. It highlights black projects and mainstream scientific research that are significant to many other areas of ufology and other paranormal subjects. It was discovered that everything witnessed during the Rendlesham Forest incident was seen before, either in and around the forest or around the world before and many times since the incident in Suffolk. People keep on talking about Orford Ness Lighthouse. Uh, Tell us from, you were there, can you see the lighthouse? Did the lighthouse confuse you? Again, this is something that at the time, even after the event happened and then the information started leaking out, you know, and you had skeptics out there and they tried to explain this whole thing with the lighthouse. Hmm. What I can tell you is this, I've been there almost two years. I've been on that gate at night during alerts and other things. You could not see the lighthouse from the gate where we were at. In fact, when we went back over there in 10, I challenged Ripath to come out and meet with us to show me how what we initially saw from the East Gate was the lighthouse affecting what we saw. He wouldn't do it, okay? So the fact of the matter was we saw strange stuff going on in the forest at the lighthouse, at the East Gate, okay? Lighthouse wasn't in play, right? We went down to the end of the road. Again, there was strange stuff in the forest. Lighthouse wasn't in play, okay? We got permission to go out. When we went out, we had an encounter with something in the forest, up close and personal. And what I mean is we came upon something right there. Again, it wasn't the lighthouse. And the fact of the matter is, then they'll say, well, the, the sweeping light confused you. Well, there was no sweeping light. Something lit the whole area up and stayed and stayed lit up. Okay, yeah. so the whole initial encounter had nothing to do with the lighthouse. Then we saw some strange stuff from that point when we moved a little bit farther, you know, closer towards the farmer's field down by the cottages. Again, the lighthouse wasn't in play at that point. Where the lighthouse became in play was, and remember, I was out there at night at first. Okay, and I'd never been out in that area before. 
was once we got down by the cottages and we started to cross the road into the next field, that's when we saw a beacon. Now, right. if you look at my statement, it clearly states we had an encounter, then we eventually saw a beacon. And what's funny is the beacon, we started going towards the beacon. Now, you can say it in hindsight because I didn't ever, I never understood totally the weird feelings we were having beforehand, the static electricity, the hair standing up, things seem to be slower, all this stuff. And they'll try to explain it away with, well, your adrenaline was flowing and all that. No, 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 no. I've been in situations where the adrenaline's flowing. There's, that wasn't adrenaline. That was something that was there that was affecting us. What's interesting is James did some great research and found the fact that the lighthouse was actually being the EM frequencies into the forest. And yeah. also Andrew Pike told me that they were beaming EM frequencies through the tunnels into the forest. Now, the interesting thing is right. all of that affected what we were seeing, how we were dealing with it and everything else. And so as we got closer, right. then eventually we identified the lighthouse. But what we saw in the sky above us and what we encountered firsthand wasn't the lighthouse other than the what the effects right. could have been from the frequencies themselves being generated towards our our location and when we got out to the coast is yeah. when we identified for sure what there was a lighthouse there but the final factor i want to bring into this was i went back in 2018 and what we did was we recreated mm -hmm. the route well from the time the event started at 0300 or a little after till the time i remember coming back which was five okay and the reason why I remember that was when we got back, we talked briefly about it. And my watch was 15 minutes slow was the fact that there's no way in heck mm. we could have gotten from Eastgate, even though we drove partially into the forest on foot, we could have gotten from where we had our encounter out to where I remember being and then all the way back to the Eastgate in that time frame. It wasn't, it wasn't possible. Right. And even into my hypnosis, I talk about how, I don't remember as we were walking back certain things that we came across coming back. So I can't explain it. People have tried to say we were abducted. I'm not saying that. I can just tell you there was no way we had some missing time and there was no way we could have gotten from where we were out and back in that time frame. Never mind the fact that the lighthouse, which, you know, came into play with the frequencies being utilized and everything else. James, um, Orford Ness, a fascinating area. Um, it has been used by Robert Watson Watts. He used this um, um, Essex clapboard black enclosure, which is called a black beacon, to put things in World War II for radio direction finding. But it was just basically a, uh, a hollow tower which uh, with multiple floors inside. You can go and visit it today. Um, so is it possible that in, by the 1980s that it could have been re reused to house other, other yeah, things? Yeah, um, it was uh, an experimental, uh, used for experimental um, antennas. Um, basically, um, they, they utilized it originally. It was uh, they call, I think, it was called a hyperbolic antenna system. Um, basically, like that. So, you send you can, right. you can detect things in the sky, you detect, de de detect things at ground level. And um, right. when I was looking at um, a few uh, papers on the subject. Um, these could also be utilised in sending out very low frequency waves um, in the sky and along the and along the, the, the base of the ground as well. Um, when I was looking at some of the um, Department of Defence documents, right. um, the, uh, the extremely low waves or very low frequency waves uh, that could be utilised could be used for detecting um, not only vehicles but individuals as well. Just to, just to reiterate what John was talking about in regards to the lighthouse, the lighthouse. Uh, now, we know the Black Beacon is separate from the lighthouse. Uh, the lighthouse itself. Now, unfortunately, every time I try to go back um, and find the pages for, that I used to have, they all come up error, error 404 now. 
Uh, but what I did find about six years ago, seven years right. ago now, it was actually experiments within the lighthouse itself, and there was photographs of the machinery, and and, and the, you know the, the windows and that with the machinery underneath it, and they were actually um, experimenting with right. uh, lidar. Which, if you go back to what terahertz radiation is, terahertz radiation is what they use in the airports when they scan you, when they scan you, they can go through. Terahertz right. radiation can also be used to look through walls and everything else, never mind the fact that it can be used mm -hmm. for underground stuff. And one of the interesting stories that I got told was I met a guy in D.C. one time that talked about the uh, straight line radar. He said some of the effects that they experienced right. back when they first started utilizing it because it wasn't shielded properly, the people using it was shielding properly, it was some of the same effects we described. And all of them came down with cancer, I think it was leukemia or some form of cancer. Mm. Unfortunately, everybody in his crew had died but him and he was in remission. But what he said was, take a look oh. at the systems that were being developed and worked on before straight line radar. Straight line radar itself and what became it came after straight line radar he said, majority of that stuff will be classified, but he said, because the advancements right. keep going along, but as they advance, different things from one particular weapon will maybe will be utilized differently in another. So it's clear that, like as James says, they were using the, 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 the black antenna, the old radar system, but the ra that radar system was developed yeah. off of the work on the death ray. Then they developed the uh, radar then they're working on other systems, including the system James described, ground penetrating radar, or could see through physical, you know, solid objects and stuff. So all this stuff was being worked on and utilized to include SDI outside, you know, the back gate. And right. this is all advancements in weaponization to include the fact that Andrew Pike was down there during our event working on studying of the known phenomenon that was in the area, which was an energy source that can be related to plasmas. Yeah. So all this was together to include how when Keats talks about how you could control plasmas with radar sweeps, you could control plasmas right. with lasers, and all that technology was being, had been either developed or being worked on there. I think we've talked a lot about um, mm -hmm. the spoils of war, and we've also mentioned Foo Fighters. Uh, Britain, at the end of World War II, went and took all the continuous wave radar that Germany used, these focused um, straight line radar, and brought them back to this place called Bordsea. Oh, that's right next to Rendlesham Forest. And they, as you've just said, John, things develop from one thing to another. And I think there's a direct link between the German continuous wave into straight line and into the type of um, CW radar that the Bloodhounds were using. Let, let me just quickly explain this for people who, who don't understand. Most radar is pulsed, and you send out a pulse, and it's um, with a single antenna. You send it out, you stop, and then you listen, and then you get on a return blip, missing blip, missing blip. Now, if you're a bloodhound, um, surface to air missile for close uh, 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 defense, you want to bring, send, send out a continuous beam, you know, meh, and have all the data back. And that was that was what CW radar was, but. As Winston Keach has said, CW radar has a side effect of being able to steer plasma. And we know that CW radar um, uh, can produce Foo Fighters. So this is all linked, and this was all going on at Borsia, Orford Ness, at the Black Beacon. And that's fantastically interesting information, James, that you just said, that you've actually seen, although it might now be not available, stuff inside the Trinity House, Orford Ness Lighthouse. Because we're going to go on in a minute and discuss that from one of our viewers. Military secrecy and a general view by the Ministry of Defence is there was no defence significance in Rendlesham Forest proved to be wrong, and through declassified paperwork it is shown that this view 
might be just a cover story. Although much of the scientific conclusions into harnessing the military application of high-energy plasma were in place by the 1980s, developments and further research unfolded over the following decades, appearing with an eerie habit, adding strength to the fact advanced plasma weapons were being developed. When discussing exotic propulsion, integrating plasma, physicist and patent holder Salvatore Pais has the following to say about the tremendous power in a plasma weapon. You will never achieve these kind of energy densities with solids, but you can achieve this with plasmas. Now exactly how that's done, I cannot tell you, because that could represent an issue of national security, sir. I am a patriot. So here in 2024, has UAP technology now been weaponized? I believe so. The, the apparent experts say it's not all um, non-human intelligence. Some of it more than likely is, but are covered under classified projects. Um, uh, obviously, because they're classified, they, that's as far as they can possibly go. And, uh, and I think it's just a matter of blending the two, so to become one. So, John, your Freedom of Information request was asking that very question, but in the years 2012 and 2013. So now in 2024, you must be pretty convinced that the observables that we've talked about and the physics that we've talked about are now being I'm, I'm gonna developed. I'm going to steal a line from you, Professor. The truth is out there. And, and, and it's, called, it's right. called the ufology is... A, a smoke screen or a counter screen being utilized to cover up weapons usage, development of weapons. But also the fact is, is they never, we've never gotten to the point of where we've drawn some of this technology advancement from. Those 38 papers right. are, are there written by people with, you know, high level degrees that have worked inside government forever. Some of them project managers like Hal Putoff that ran Stargate, that, that they've been exposed to this stuff. In fact, we're going to do an episode in the future talking about Hal Putoff and how he did the work for the DOD that actually that had all did for the MOD. So this is all being looked at. This is all being studied. The, the stuff that remains classified is the source material. These reports leak out. Little pieces of them do. Some of them are partially classified but they're coming out with this information. And this is a piece of the puzzle. And one of the pieces, we're putting together a large puzzle and we're piecing it piece by piece together with the people and the information provided. Some of it disappears because what they don't want people to do is look at the big picture. They want them to zero in on focusing on little right. things, just like they did with Reynolds. When for years there was arguments about whether it was the lighthouse that fooled all these people, including Colonel Hall, who had been a combat controller in Vietnam. You know, what? and, and then the argument of who was there and who wasn't there and exactly, you know, what was seen and what wasn't seen and everything else. The point being is there's a big, big bright band world of information out there that are helping us put together this particular puzzle. Are there other puzzles? Did a, a solid object crash at Roswell has there been other objects seen, you know, like flying saucers and stuff? That's a good question. I mean, but you can also take some of this information and go back to that. Where it goes back in the 40s that James has seen, maybe even earlier, where they started to understand these frequencies and their abilities to utilize them. The biggest problem they had was the energy sources and the computing the computing problem of controlling it. And now it's pretty scary where we're going with AI coming on board. So there's a cat and mouse game going on all the time, but it does go back to UAPs. Yeah. And I'm sorry if it upsets people in the nuts and bolts words of ufology, but this plays a part into what we're dealing with, including the fact that it very well is, as Condine said, intelligent in nature. 
so as we promised last time, we've chosen a few of your excellent viewer questions um, for John and James and myself to answer. Uh, starting with Alan uh, Keeling. Excellent one, Alan. Um, he says, I'll read it because it's very, very nice comment. John Burroughs definitely deserves better answers. Well said, Alan, considering all that he's been through. This subject is obviously extremely classified on both sides of the pond. He must be English. And it makes me wonder if I will live enough, live long enough to actually find out what actually happened at Rendlesham Forest. Now, I chose um, Alan's question because he touches on a subject that was very close to my heart as a filmmaker and as a journalist, as a researcher, about how we actually um, tell you, how we expose what actually happened. We now probably know the big picture of Rendlesham Forest, who, what, where, when and why, and how we've discussed tonight. Um, John, what do you think that we are close? And do you think Alan will hear what really happened at Rendlesham Forest? from us and from in his lifetime or is it just going to be it, it depends secret? i mean we're doing a very good job of putting this together and i mean all you have to do is go to condine and take a look at condine and it describes a lot of the effects and stuff that went on to it you know went on with us when i read the report it really set off a light bulb in my mind exactly what we were exposed to right but the interesting thing was the line in there that says we were probably exposed to higher levels and longer levels of UAP, UAP radiation, which part, is part of what I presented to the VA for my settlement. But I think right. this, what we're doing will give him the answer. Will the government ever totally, you know, say that, yeah, they're spot on? Probably not. But then they're, they're very good at keeping everything secret. How much do we really know how stealth technology totally works? Radars work. Missiles right. work. All that stuff is still classified. We're aware of these weapon systems exist, but we really don't even know how they, how they work, how they're put together, let alone how they're used in the field of battle. You know, Never mind that a lot of the right. stuff that we're talking about would be used in countermeasures, and they surely don't want that to come out on how that would be deceptive and utilized, right. you know, to, to fool the enemy, you know, uh, uh, what they're actually dealing with. So will there be a total answer? No, but the documents, the Condon report and stuff that we found paint a pretty good picture. Never mind the group yeah. that came forward, led by Christopher Mellon and Hal Putoff and their work inside government, they pretty much painted a pretty good picture that it exists and it's going on. Right. Will there be an answer probably from our government? No, that's why I laughed at the whole disclosure group when they demand answers and they're not gonna get right. them. But we're going to do our best to paint a big, a, a broad scope and put the puzzle together as best we can. James, you, you've worked on this for a number of years. I know, because you're a great friend, I know that us three know a lot more than we can say. Can you reach out to Alan and say that he will get some answers? You will get some answers. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Another question. This one's from Johnny71C. Now, Johnny uh, makes lots of very smart comments on my channel. And this question is very pertinent. He says, something you guys might not know is that the lighthouse, Orford Ness Lighthouse, owned by Trinity House, was demolished and a local BBC film crew went to film its demolition and was told not to film it. Why? That's his question. Do we believe that the lighthouse, the, the actual um, Trinity House lighthouse, the Orford Ness Lighthouse, um, contained stuff... Um, that was part of the Orford Ness um, military complex. Quite possibly, it was still had had um, certain things underground that were linked to uh, to, to uh, the nuclear power plant just down the road. A man from Suffolk wanted to buy the lighthouse because it's so famous and preserve it. And um, lighthouses are built like a kit, like a Lego kit, and you could easily take off 
semicircular block by block and block and rebuilt it in his farm, in his stately home. And he was said, no, you can't have it. And in the end, all he got was just the, 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 ta- the, the light on the top. And that's possibly now uh, visible. But they were definitely hiding something. So, Johnny, thank you. It's a very good question. Okay, this one is from Test Rabbit, um, a hive testing rabbit. Interesting that you mentioned in a previous film the God Helmet, and we'll have to explain what that is, uh, which I'm familiar with, so he's probably a military person. Um, is there a connection between how the God Helmet, and one of you can describe what that is, and how uh, even Havana Syndrome might work? You see how he's connecting um, military technology and and human brains. Tell us what the God right. Helmet is the, first. Uh, the God Helmet is um, a cranial device that was um, first um, utilised by uh, Michael Persinger um, when he was trying to uh, Trying to correlate the electromagnetic brain function um, with people that see UFOs, people that see ghosts, people that have these out of body experiences. And by utilizing certain frequencies right. on this cranial device, he was able to, to, to induce certain feelings, certain visions, um, and experiences within people that were. Um, that he was experimenting with that were using this device on their on on their heads. Through my years, I I met with these different people, been exposed to things, talked about things, and at the time it didn't register, but or totally register until you start digging deeper into the whole concept. And once you start seeing things, just like what James is describing with the God's helmet, persons your work with those guys. And, and volley and stuff. And they were looking at the effects on the mind and what not only how could they affect the mind. So think about it if they wanted to plant something in somebody to come back, you know, and, and tell a tale like a spy or something. They could wipe their memory of what they really what they really saw and remember and then put plant something in them. You know what I mean? They could maybe go inside yeah. a spy or a pilot or capture somebody because torture doesn't work very often. They'll, you'll say whatever you, to survive. But to get the true nuts and bolts, right. you can maybe go in and you know do that. If you go back and you look at all these different projects, most of them all go back to the same, same group. I mean, that was two things I had a defense contractor right. tell me that, that I spoke with that wanted me to meet with the Arrow Committee said some of the same suspects show up in all this stuff, you know, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and I've been told that by other people, these same people all are people that have been working on this for decades and they're still active in it today. And, and, and the, the, the answers are there. It's just, are you willing to accept yeah. what, where it leads you, you know, and what a kick green sand mirage man. The real truth won't be as scary as what the public's been led to believe. But there is a truth to all this. But the problem is, are the, are, is humanity willing to accept what, what we're really dealing with? You know, and that's the other factor. I don't think they totally understand this completely themselves. But they're a lot farther ahead. I think the United States and Britain are farther ahead than a lot of these other countries. Uh, that was a really fascinating discussion, gentlemen. Um, I think that this is a very strong film. I think very much using your excellent research, James, and your experiences and research, John. Um, we've painted a picture, hopefully very clearly, of what was happening in 1980 in England and specifically in a piece of scrubby woodland in Suffolk called Rendlesham Forest. But there's more to this story than meets the eye. Um, You need to stay tuned for an upcoming episode where we really push the boat out and describe actually what happened at Rendlesham Forest ended up as an international incident. The Foreign Office and the State Department went ballistic. And this is all part 
of the Randlesham Forest incident. The truth is out there.